Good morning, everyone. I hardly feel like I need this, but it probably is easier for you all. I'm so glad that you're here, and we're sitting in the dark, obviously, uh, so that we can see this, this screen, but thank you for coming to sit in the dark uh, and be enlightened here at First Presbyterian Church. This is our seventh Mullen Lecture. Uh, we started, this started right when Curtis and I uh, came to the church. Eight years ago, we took a break during COVID, and so it is so, so wonderful to be able to, to do this again, to have um, Dr. Christine Yoder come to, to hopefully make us wiser. Um, for those who aren't familiar, I'm sure most of you are, uh, the Reverend Dr. Don Mullen was our parish associate for a long time. Um, and he had a heart for ministry and a heart for the world and sought to always expand his own understanding of God and his own faith, but also his knowledge about the world. And so when he retired from his role here, this series was established. And we are always honored for those who come to share and teach us. And so we are also honored that you are here to gr come and learn and grow in the spirit of Don Mullen. So um, most of you were here in worship yesterday and got to uh, hear Dr. Yoder preach. Um, some of you were in class with her at Columbia Theological Seminary in your time uh, as seminary students. Um, Dr. Yoder is a, an Old Testament scholar and professor, but is now functioning as a dean of faculty and so isn't actively teaching. So we get to be her class today. Um, Thank you so much. An, 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 an important role for us to play. So will you help me in welcoming Dr. Yoder? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily, for that kind introduction. Um, and many thanks to the Mullen family for the generous provision of resources um, to have these lectures. Um, I'm really um, delighted. It's a privilege and an honor to be here um, uh, giving the lecture um, and to be able to be in worship with you yesterday. Uh, I'm very grateful for the hospitality that has been extended to me so generously. I have slept very well in the mountain air. Um, I've wandered the streets and seen the dahlias. It's just really um, been a privilege to be here. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and now for a chance to think together about the nature of wisdom. Uh, it is the case that the study of wisdom has been at the heart of my own vocation uh, for over two decades now. If you'd asked me when I was going to seminary, um, would I someday have written a lot about the book of Proverbs, I would have laughed. Um, not only was Proverbs not really part of my canon within a canon, we all have our favorite books and texts that we turn to, uh, but I really had no, I had a sense, which I think is fairly common, uh, that Proverbs was kind of practical, sort of, you know, user-friendly how-tos um, that really didn't hold the same gravitas or theological significance um, as some of the other books, uh, particularly in the Old Testament and New Testament. So I didn't, I was surprised when an invitation from a remarkable teacher um, called me in uh, to considering the wisdom literature broadly, about which I'll say more in a moment, and the book of Proverbs in particular. Uh, and I have been captivated ever since. Um, the search for wisdom, if you hear nothing else this morning, the search for wisdom is a lifelong search. The one who believes they have wisdom, if someone says, I am wise, the ancient sages will say, you're an idiot. <laughs> so the search for wisdom is perpetual, and I have no sense, I have no, I wouldn't even be, dare to believe I will ever fully understand it, but it is certainly the case that the development of wisdom, both individually and as communities, is vital for our flourishing and for the flourishing of the world God so loves. So, what I'm going to do this morning, um, because I've been working on this a very long time, it's hard to be told, even graciously, you have an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so I'm going to do my best to, to provide an overview of what this thing is called wisdom, some of the access points, ways we can get into thinking about this concept through the lens of the ancient Near East, and more particularly, ancient Israel um, and its literature. So I'm going to start broadly. What is this thing we're talking about, namely wisdom? 
And then I'll move in, as time permits, and look at one example in Scripture, that is the book of Proverbs. Uh, We'll consider its preface um, and uh, its design to think a little bit further uh, about what wisdom is and how is it that you form people um, into uh, the craft of wisdom. So that's my goal. Um, I am here, however, as a resource for you, um, and I really do welcome questions, comments, interruptions, corrections um, all along the way. So rather than holding on to your questions till the very end, because believe me, I'll talk right up to the very end, (laughs) I would rather you sort of jump in, and in fact, I'm going to get us going in a minute, jump in and say, hey, can you say more? Or wait a minute, I thought, and could you possibly, I'd rather this be a conversation than really a sort of standard lecture where I speak to you for an hour and 15 minutes. So don't hesitate to interrupt me um, and keep this as as informative for you and the questions you have as possible. I'm going to begin actually by talking with you a bit about a significant metaphor that ancient Israel uses to talk about the concept of wisdom. The metaphor is that of a tree. So I want to think for a moment about this metaphor with you. On the screen, you see um, the angel oak. Have any of you seen this in real life? It's just, it's near Charleston on St. John's Island. I've never actually seen it in real life, but I love the pictures of it. Um, It's four or 500 years old. Uh, It's, um, I've got all the measurements here so you get them. Um, It is about 66 feet tall. It's 28 feet in circumference. And it produces shade that covers 17,200 feet. Its longest branch is 187 feet in length. I can only imagine, those of you who have seen it can say more, I can only imagine how breathtaking, how much awe it will inspire in us to see such a tree. Let's open the floor and talk a bit about what you think about when someone says wisdom is like a tree, or even more, not the simile, the metaphor, wisdom is a tree. What do you think of? Call it out. Strength, Strength. so something about the tree's capacity to to hold up in the midst of storms, changes of scenes, scenery and seasons, and so on. So strength, what else? Deep roots. Um, Wisdom, um, I'm going to build on what you say, wisdom was definitely understood to be rooted deeply, not only in God's own creation, but in the traditions and learnings of the people who came before us. So there's a valuation, as we'll talk about later, of elders, those who have, have navigated life successfully and have deep roots living in the world. What else? Wonderful. Sanctuary and protection. So the shade, that you'll, you'll get um, references to the shade of wisdom. Um, those who live in wisdom, um, that is, abide as, as in a nest in the tree of wisdom. Uh, so this is a place um, where life dwells, where life can have protection, home. Uh, they'll dwell in the tree and even inside the tree. So the tree is a living organism that sustains life otherwise. What else? Well maintained. <laughs> And they saved it. So trees require, if I can pull from that, trees require cultivation and care. Many do, not all do. But many require cultivation and care. There is a point at which a tree needs support and tending uh, from those who wish, wish it to flourish. What else? Yes. Excellent. So this, this is a, this trees are different in different seasons. Same tree will look very different in different seasons. This is also true of wisdom. What is wise in one moment may very well not be wise three months later. We'll talk about that. So wisdom is also changing and seasonal uh, depending on what's happening in the circumstances in the world. What else? Branches. Okay, so this capacity of the tree to stretch uh, and to grow. Um, so, tr- so it presses the sort of roots and branches. The, these are organisms that reach up 
uh, and reach out. Um, so there's growth. And on those branches, um, you know, there also may be flowering and fruit. Uh, so these uh, can be life-giving, food-providing um, uh, organisms. What else? I think of George Gilmer's poem. Oh, yes, say more. Well, uh, it was written during World War I, and I'm thinking that he's looking out over no man's land yeah. where there are no trees, and he thinks I shall never see mm. a poem as lovely as a tree. As a tree. So that it is in itself, a tree is in itself aesthetically beautiful. Um, there is, this is also about appealing to the senses, right? There's something exquisite about a tree. Um, remember when um, Eve, Adam and Eve are in the garden, uh, and the serpent invites her to take another look at the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And she takes a look. One of the things she notices is that it was beautiful to look at. There's something about the aesthetic pleasure um, of a tree. It's beauty. What else? Roots, branches, strength. Uh, age is growth rate so slow that it's imperceptible. Ah, yes. Yes. This sta that's a really helpful comment. So, so, so the slow rate of growth of a tree. Yeah. So a sl um, his comment, of course, I'll repeat it, I'll repeat it. So the, the, um, his observation is about the slow growth of a tree. It's not always perceptible. Um, and that, uh, that lends to a, a sort of long life, oftentimes. It is true that wisdom as a tradition in cultures also tends to move more slowly than the latest news or the fastest slogan, or right, the kinds of quick ways we speak, wisdom tends to move more deliberately and at a slower pace uh, than certainly advertisements and slogans. What else? Excellent. So the trees, yeah, the trees own sustenance, and I'm repeating it. I'm, I understand. I'm repeating it. I'm repeating it. So the sustenance and roots of the, of the tree itself come from the roots and come in, in and through the tree. So the tree draws from the very soil in which it dwells. This is also true of wisdom. Wisdom arises in different cultures and communities in ways that are consistent with the soils in those places, metaphorically speaking. All right, so are you all getting a sense? One other thing I want to add in terms of thinking about trees is the resilience of trees. They bend, but don't break in a storm. They can't break, but they have a capacity, of course, to bend in wind and return to their original position. Wisdom also has a flex capacity, if I can say it that way, has a capacity to bend and and change and then reset itself uh, when circumstances and storms have passed. Now, I'm going to move one more step. So we have, we've, we've pooled a number of ways that thinking about wisdom as a tree, as a metaphor, um, is helpful. I'm going to push one more step. In ancient Israel, this, this image of the tree um, becomes linked profoundly with the tree of life. What you see on the screen is an image. These are very common iconographic images that we see across the ancient Near East of what was known as, a, as the, the tree of life. Other cultures, Egypt, for example, talked about trees of life. Uh, it was not particular to ancient Israel. Uh, so what you see at the top is, an, is a common image of a tree of life. This is from a late 9th, early 8th century uh, shrine found in the northern part of Israel at Kintilad Ajrud. And you'll notice about this image that the tree itself, their roots are represented. You see it sort of as a ball of roots at the base of the tree. You see that this tree is in the midst of flowering, so that there is fruit, this is in, it's in the season of spring or in the season of fruit bearing, uh, and that ibexes, or in, in other images it's different creatures, are up close to the tree in order to partake of its fruit. Often the animals are touching the tree uh, in a way that s signals their flourishing as a result of eating from and being in the vicinity of the tree itself. Now, the tree of life in the Christian canon is referred to in three different places. Only three places. Where's the first? 
Genesis. Okay, and what do we learn about the tree of life in this Genesis story, Genesis 2 and 3? What do we learn? We learn, okay, so God creates this garden. God um, plants trees of every possible variety. And in the midst of this garden also puts two trees that have a seemingly greater significance in the sense that one is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and one is the tree of life. We know how the story goes. Uh, God says, don't eat of these two trees. You can have anything you want in the rest of the garden, but don't eat of these two trees. What hap- as soon as you hear that, what do you know is going to happen? They're going to eat of the, uh, one of those trees at least. Uh, sure enough, that's what happens. They eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And by the end of the story with the serpent and Adam and Eve, what we discover is that the humans have been expelled from the Garden of Eden Uh, And God has set up flaming swords and and cherubim to guard the entrance lest we ever try to return. That is, by the end of Genesis 3 and 4, by the end of Genesis 3, um, we are cut off from access to the tree of life. Where else do you hear reference to the tree of life? Revelation chapter 22 at the other end in the New Testament, other end of the canon. Uh, So you could say the tree of life frames the Christian canon in this regard. You have mention of the tree of life and it is straddling the rivers, the, the river of God coursing down between, and it bears 12 different varieties of fruits, one different kind each month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. So this is an image, very evocative, actually, of the Garden of Eden, right? The water is surrounding. This is a lush tree. It's used for healing and life. And sure enough, the tree appears in Revelation in an apocalyptic future. That is a future that is set apart um, from the present reality in which we dwell, right? The The world as we know it, as Revelation describes, will end And there will be a new future ushered in by God. And in that future, the tree of life appears as a source of healing and nourishment. So if we only had those two references to the tree of life, we might despair. We might say, well, it's cut off from my access in Genesis 2 and 3, and I can't ever go back. I can't ever find Eden. That's another conversation we can talk, we can talk about later. And I'm cut off from access to the tree of life in Revelation because that's an apocalyptic end time to which we do not yet have access. We might say we can't get to the tree of life except for the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 3, the text that you see on the screen presents wisdom who is personified in the book as a woman who's in the city streets calling out, inviting people to come and study and learn from her. The parent who is the speaker in Proverbs 1 to 9 um, describes her in chapter 3 as a tree of life. And notice the imagery. Those who lay hold of her, right, get up and touch her, those who hold fast to her or embrace her are called happy. Uh, Happy, another way you could translate the term here, ashray, for happy is blessed, uh, fortunate, um, uh, and so on. So it's a sense that to actually be with wisdom, to embrace her, to hold on to her as an animal would to the tree of life, is to find the way of flourishing and joy. So, tree, metaphor, broadly speaking, tree of life, more particular. So now let's move in and talk about, I know that's a lot of text, hang with me, it's mostly to prompt me so I don't forget anything. Um, Let's move in and talk from the metaphor, this organic living metaphor, and um, mythological metaphor with the tree of life. Let's move in from that to talk about, okay, what is it we're talking about more concretely? Please. So, yes, of course. So, um, so uh, I know if I'll repeat. Um, she's thinking about Psalm 1. Do you want to say more about why? Um, just that it allows, gives us an end to participate with the tree. Yes. It's not something that was before and will come 
It's present. Wonderful. So in Psalm 1, the tree is not explicitly referred to as a tree of life, but the imagery is very evocative, right? It's the tree right by the river. Um, it is the place of dwelling and life. Those who are not with this tree are like chaff that blow in the wind. So this is very much, Psalm 1 has been called a wisdom psalm for just this reason, because of this, these evocative connections. So thank you. And it's the gateway, Psalm 1, is the gateway into the Psalter itself. So a lot more to be, books have been written about that. So, <laughs> All right, so let's talk about what is it we're talking about. We're talking first, so, so the big question I'm asking is, what is wisdom? One way to answer that question is to say wisdom is a tradition it's actually present in, in all cultures. It manifests differently in different cultures, but it's, it's in every culture. But it's a tradition, it's a practice, it's a skill, um, and it is a family of texts. So when I study in my, my little corner of the world, when I study the wisdom texts of Israel, I often have on my desk wisdom from Mesopotamia, wisdom from um, uh, Sumeria, wisdom from uh, Egypt especially. Because these were common cultural traditions, enterprises, that we believe were shared across. We believe ancient Israel had access to, even drew upon, ancient Egypt's wisdom. We'll, I'll say more about that later. So, in the ancient Near East, there are collections of wisdom texts um, that share many of the features of the literature that we'll be talking about this morning. Um, and there are many echoes of similar proverbs across this literature. So you'll hear an Egyptian proverb and say, oh yeah, I know one of the, I've heard that in the book of Proverbs. The metaphors might be slightly different. The language is definitely different, but they're speaking into similar truths that they've observed in their life as sources of wisdom. Now, in our tradition, in the Christian tradition, and in the, um, well, in the Christian tradition, let's say it that way, um, biblically, when I say wisdom literature, the texts that I hope come to your mind immediately are Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes. Okay, now right there, when I say Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes are the wisdom texts of ancient Israel, you, I hope you all, you think for a moment, well, that's a kind of mixed bag of texts, right? I mean, think Proverbs seems kind of positive, and we can find our way to wisdom, and we can hold on to her, and here's how we do it, and Job is despairing over the suffering of the innocent. Ecclesiastes is ready to throw the whole enterprise out the window, yet somehow trying to cling to it. These are all sages. These are all students of wisdom who are wrestling with the traditions and the world they're living in. Wisdom doesn't shirk, shirk from struggling with the suffering of the innocent. It doesn't shirk from wrestling with why the wicked prosper and the wise suffer. It, it engages these matters head on. It, um, Ecclesiastes, you could easily say, is sort of a Carpe diem, has a carpe diem theology, sees the day. Friends, because he would say if he were here, I suspect, it's the only time you know you have. This moment is the only moment you know you have. You can't go back to what was before, and you certainly have no guarantees about tomorrow. These are all out of the wisdom tradition, and, part, and I'll say more about how we group them together in a moment. Occasionally, uh, if you open up introductory textbooks to the wisdom literature, I don't suspect you do this in your spare time, but if you do, um, you might notice that some include within this tradition the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, um, uh, which, which is um, attributed to, or Solomon is mentioned a couple of times in the song. Um, I'll say more about it in a moment, uh, but the song... Um, is really, in my judgment at least, much more um, along the lines of love poetry as a genre than kind of fitting into the wisdom tradition. That's not to say you don't learn something, actually many things from the Song of Song. It's instructive, but it's not, strictly speaking, wisdom literature. And we've already mentioned um, that some of the Psalms, Psalm 1, for example, also have been grouped into the wisdom texts of the Old Testament, 
Um, there's a very vigorous debate about this that's still happening in my, in my guild. Um, and at the end of the day, I don't have, really have a dog in the hunt, except to say um, that there is clearly some shared vocabulary, some shared ideas that psalmists and sages drew upon. So it's not surprising to see echoes um, of wisdom in the Psalter. All right, notice in the yellow, the tradition of wisdom in ancient Israel is associated most closely with the figure of King Solomon. Now, one way to hold that, Israel has a habit of associating traditions with certain key figures in its history. When I say the law, who do you think of? When I say uh, the Psalms, who do you think of? David. So notice we've got these rich um, traditions and texts that get readily associated with a key figure. For Israel, it is Solomon when we think about the wisdom literature. The book of Proverbs is explicitly connected with him. Uh, Ecclesiastes alludes to him. Um, and what we notice in the apocryphal texts of Sirach, Baruch, and of course the wisdom of Solomon, uh, his, uh, his name, his, his, um, his authority as a sage passes far into the centuries after him. Um, now, uh, one thing to note about this, to, uh, just as a reminder about Solomon, one of the reasons why Solomon is held as the quintessential sage of ancient Israel is that Solomon's sort of first move, as you remember from 1 Kings, was to pray for wisdom. Do you remember that? Give me a wise and discerning heart um, so that I might uh, lead your people. Um, and God responds to that prayer um, by providing not only wisdom, but a lot of other things, wealth and honor and so on and so on. It's the latter things that ultimately get Solomon into a lot of trouble. But Solomon prays for wisdom, and the story immediately after that prayer, do you all remember the story after that prayer? That wisdom is tested. Two women and a baby. The baby dies. The women uh, bring it to the king, right? And the king, or the, excuse me, the, the, they're fighting over the baby. And the, they bring the baby to the king. And, and Solomon's wisdom, which we can argue about, Solomon's wisdom is divide the baby. And the real mother, of course, says, no, 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 don't do that. It was his strategy, of course, to discern who is the real parent. Now, a lot has been written on that <laughs> story, too. I don't begin to commend this as a strategy, um, but it is a way that the text, the stories, set up both the prayer for di uh, the divine gift of wisdom and Solomon's clear receipt of it by his capacity to navigate this dilemma immediately. It's a test. What we also know from the story of Solomon is that people come from all over the ancient Near East to learn from him including the Queen of Sheba. Uh, so, so 1 Kings 4, I don't know if you have your Bibles with you. I should have asked you to bring them. Um, but 1 Kings 4, if you have your Bible, I want you to see how he teaches. People come from all over the world, and his fame as a sage spreads. So in chapter 4, verse 29 and following, I'll just read from there. You'll, I want you to pay attention to how he teaches. God gave Solomon very great wisdom. I'm in 1 Kings 4, verses 29 and following. God gave Solomon very great wisdom, discernment, and breadth of understanding as vast as the sand and the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East and all the people of Egypt. Here, Egypt was considered the epicenter of wisdom in the ancient context. He was wiser than anyone else. Uh, wiser than Ethan the Ezrahite and Haman and Calcol and Darda, son of Mahol. His fame spread throughout all of the surrounding nations. Here it is. He composed 3,000 proverbs, some of which we may still have, and his songs numbered 1,005. And here's what I want you to really see. He would speak of trees. He would speak of trees. He would speak of trees. From the cedar that is in the Lebanon to the hyssop that grows in the wall, he would speak about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. 
he would speak of trees and animals and birds and reptiles and fish. Keep that in mind for a question I'm going to ask you later. All right. So, uh, do we all have a sense of there's a tradition and there are texts? Eventually, what is in many cultures an oral tradition spoken? When you first heard a proverb in your childhood, my hunch is that somebody said it to you, right? You didn't read a proverb the first time. Rather, it's more likely a parent spoke to you in a proverb. In my family, uh, there, are, there are, of course, communal, there are, there are wide, widely shared proverbs. There are also fam- what we call family proverbs, uh, those things that you hear over and over again, cross-generationally. And in my household, we joke that a family proverb was my father saying, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> it happened in it I, over and over and over again. It's repeated, it has duration, and my sister who has children, younger sister who has children, has found herself using it. That makes it a proverb, right, when it starts pa- getting passed down across generations. Okay, so it is, it's oral. It's largely an oral tradition, which you must keep in mind when you're reading these texts in the scripture, right? Somebody wrote them down eventually, but they were largely circulating orally. Same is true across the ancient world. These are, these are oral that eventually get written down in text to preserve them, which we'll talk about. Okay, so a second way to think about what is wisdom, a second response, if you ask me that question, is I would say it's a worldview. It's a certain kind of perspective that a person can take. And I want to flesh that out. What is this perspective? It's a worldview that actually starts from the position of the human, God's creature, the human, and asks the question, what is good for the human in life? Said differently, how is it that the human flourishes? This is about well-being. So notice I'm starting from Uh, Some would say kind of on the ground, talking to my neighbor, thinking about the human community and its flourishing in the world God so fiercely loves. Notice I'm not starting, this is one of the distinctions, I'm not starting from God gave Moses the commandments on the top of Mount Sinai. We talk about those kinds of stories where God gives directives, God gives law as gift, God gives statutes and ordinances as theology from above, right? This is wisdom coming from, this is instruction and law coming from on high. You will often see and hear people talk about wisdom literature as theology from below. It's starting in the human condition, And it's asking the question, what do I know, what do I see, what do I understand is good for the human in life? Which means, in one of its key sources, in answering that question, is human experience. This is the tradition in the Old Testament that highly values the learnings of daily life. This is the tradition that says our everyday interactions, how we are thinking and acting and engaging one another, not only are a source of knowledge and understanding, but have theological significance. So here's where, do you remember when I said, I never, boy, I never would have thought I would ever work on Proverbs nearly as long as I have, because I thought it was kind of practical and how-to, and, you know, every culture has its own kind of guide, guides and Israel has had its, but it wasn't particularly theological or distinctively Israelite. This is where I was wrong. Ancient Israel believes that every interaction we have is profoundly theological. They don't distinguish between secular and sacred. So how you navigate the marketplace, what you say to your neighbor, how you engage your children, how you work for justice in the, in the city, it's all part and parcel an expression of wisdom as a gift from God. So there is no sort of practical how to apart from or different from. Rather, it's all of a piece. Uh, von Rod, Gerhard von Rod, who wrote a fantastic kind of um, seminal volume on the wisdom in Israel as an Old Testament theologian of the last century, uh, talks about exactly this, saying, I'm paraphrasing roughly, 
Every experience of, of Israel in its daily life was an experience of God, and every experience of God for Israel was an experience in daily life. You cannot separate the two. That imbues everything, right, with a certain theological import, a certain kind of confessional importance. How we live, move, breathe, talk, engage one another, and so on, is profoundly theological. So uh, it's about knowledge and application. I'll say more about that in a moment. Learning and perceiving and engaging. Okay, so that pivots us to, if that's what it is, um, it is a perspective, a worldview that's pressing this question, um, and it's looking to the world around us to learn answers. It's seeking the experience of those who are around us to learn who, are the, who or what are sources of wisdom. In your own life, what's been a source of wisdom, or who has been a source of wisdom for you? Parents, parents, friends, pastors, leaders, Teachers, books, right? Um, great stories, right? Stories are hugely instructive of wisdom. Nature, excellent. Sorry? Trials. Trials, like the struggles of life, become really form us in the, in the work of wisdom. Friends. Friends. Oh, gosh, how, what a gift a friend is, right? There's a lot, there are a lot of proverbs about friendship. A lot of Proverbs about friendship and the importance of it. Okay, for ancient Israel, there were, there were a number of sources, but I want to highlight a few. One source we've already named is the elder. Gray hair is a crown of glory, um, according to the Proverbs. Um, to, to have lived a life to the point where one is gray-haired is a sign of success and survival. And if you, why would you not want to sit with that person and learn what they've, what they've learned by navigating their life successfully? Now, I say this with all seriousness and veneration of the elder in the midst of a culture that venerates the youth and dismisses, I'm being, I'm being very stark here, but really dismisses or at least pushes to the margins the fruits of the experiences of our elders. This is a, the ancient Israel would not begin to understand that. Why would you not spend time learning from your elders? If for no other reason the elder has street smarts, it's not about book learning necessarily. It's not about a certain level of education at all. It's, it's that if you've survived, you have a certain kind of wisdom that we would all benefit from. So elders, first and foremost, teachers, parents, and so on. Secondly, uh, the sages turn to um, skilled artisans. If you're an artist, you're wise. Um, Shipbuilders, weavers, crafters, woodworkers, um, metallurgy, all of it is you have a, the capacity to take something and form something else. It requires bodily skill. It requires a kind of sensitivity in the fingers, a dexterity of thought. It is a mark of wisdom. If you're an artist, you are wise. They also look to the natural world. Um, and I want to give you a couple of examples here. Turn with me. I'm mindful of our time. Turn with me uh, to Proverbs chapter 6, if you have your Bibles. If you don't, wait for a moment while I get there, and I'll share it with you. So one of, one of the, uh, we talk about these Proverbs that are all about um, learning from the natural world as go to the ant proverbs. And it's because of this particular proverb uh, that's, get, that's repeated twice in the book of Proverbs in chapter 6. My child, oh, let me go, let me get there. Um, go to the ant, I'm in verse 6. Go to the ant, you lazy bones. Chapter 6, verse 6. Sorry, I'm now all caught up. Is everybody with me? <laughs> chapter 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, you lazy bones. Consider its ways and be wise. Without having any chief or officer or ruler, it prepares its food in the summer and gathers its sustenance in harvest. How long are you going to lie there, lazy bones? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want 
like an armed warrior. Okay, so what are we supposed to learn from the smallest of creatures, the ant? How is the ant wise? Hard work. Gosh, if you've ever watched an ant carrying three times its body weight, hard work seems an understatement, right? What else? What does the ant know? He considers the future. The ant has a sense of the patterns of time. There are times of um, abundance, harvest, and there are times, there will be times of scarcity. So what does the ant do? The ant prepares. The ant gathers what's needed when there's abundance and saves it so that in a season of scarcity, the community can survive and thrive. And notice that the ant does this without a chief, without a ruler, without an officer. This is innate to being an ant itself. It doesn't require a leader commanding it to do this labor. It does it simply because it's a creature of God, seeking to flourish in God's world. Now, flip over so you can see one more of these. Go to the end of the book, Proverbs 30, if you're looking at your Bibles. Proverbs 30. This is the wisdom of Agur. Agur, um, we believe, is an older sage, old sage. Um, I won't make the case now for time. Um, he talks about, he opens this chapter in his weariness, his fatigue, his uh, sense of the futility of trying to find wisdom. Um, and he offers a, a number of these go-to-the-ant proverbs, um, but I want to highlight one of them in particular. In chapter 30, verses 24 to 28, hear this instruction from the natural world. Four things on earth are small, yet they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people without strength, yet they provide their food in the summer. The badgers are a people without power, yet they make their homes in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet all of them march in rank. The lizard, or spider, depending on your translation, can be grasped in the hand, yet it is found in the king's palaces. Okay, what do you notice about this instruction? How so? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there, notice that there are, there's a sense of access, right? There's a sense of um, uh, they, the lizard or the spider can get into places that no ordinary person can get into. Others are making their homes in the rocks, which we know is incredibly difficult to do. Um, notice the locust. Uh, manages to walk in file, manages to move in file without a king. Let me tell you this. The, this is the only place in the book of Proverbs where there is the imagination of a world without a king. And it's the natural world that invites the possibility. You might be able, we might be able, to navigate without a king. The whole rest of the book assumes the importance of a king. Said, ants, are ants are people. Thank you so much. Yes, notice what's happened here. Agur pushes this to the next step to say, it's not just that ants are a creature that. Ants, the, he's quite deliberate. Ants are a people that. Stop thinking that we are so much more like God and so much less like an ant Friends, in the scheme of the universe and in God's good creation, we are far more people like the ant than we will ever be creatures as high as God. So this is a recognize the other creatures, communities in our midst as resources of our wisdom, as fellow peoples from whom we learn. Last thing I'll say about uh, sources of wisdom, there's a lot to say, but last thing I'll say is that um, the... Wisdom tradition is one of the most ecumenical, I'm going to use that term, traditions in the Old Testament, in the Bible. Uh, it believes seriously 
that um, because God has formed the whole world, God has made all peoples and creatures and plants and all else, that we, we benefit by studying the wisdom of other cultures and communities. By definition, no one has um, the wisdom of God uh, to themselves. Rather, every culture provides a lens into uh, the wisdom of God because God formed the whole human community. All right, now let me finish here this perspective. Um, the, uh, the, the wisdom has, I think I'm going to say it this way. As you read into the book of Proverbs, some of you, have been, I know I've been studying the book um, with Curtis's um, kind and wise help. Um, as you make your way into the book of Proverbs, especially in the first nine chapters, but it persists through the book, one of the things you start to discover is that the teacher in the book largely bifurcates the world into two, two paths, two ways. One is the way of wisdom, and one is the way of foolishness. One is the way of life, one is the way of death. One is the way of righteousness, the other is the way of wickedness. And the parent is seeking, in the first nine chapters especially, to situate his sons, this is instruction of a father to a son, or sons, to situate his sons, his children, on the path of wisdom, life, and righteousness, which he describes as bright and light uh, and without um, difficulties, without stumbling blocks, without traps. Conversely, the way of foolishness is a way that's riddled with dangers. Now, as you, as you, I certainly have this experience, I suspect over the years as I've taught Proverbs, over and over again I have students or um, church members say, Christina, it, I ultimately find that kind of bifurcation of the world really overly redu reductionistic, overly simplistic, and in the end, not very helpful. Right? Because we all know, friends, that the world is a lot more gray. We know um, that even if one is able to align themselves on the path of wisdom, which the parent promises will lead to honor and well-being and health and flourishing and riches and stability, even when one seeks to do that, we know oftentimes wise people suffer and we know that wise people um, don't always enjoy those very same benefits that are promised to them by seeking wisdom. In the same way, we certainly know, the sages did too, but we certainly know that the wicked, the, fo the foolish, also at times prosper. Certainly. Their path doesn't seem to be quite so riddled with obstacles at times. So why would the parent teach this worldview? Why would the parent try to form a youth into thinking that there is a path of wisdom, there's a path of foolishness, and it's the way God formed the world itself? Excellent. So there's this wonderful studies done on exactly this point, that it actually, if you're t teaching youth, young adults, Carving the world out in this way makes a lot of sense. Things are rather stark to begin, and then this happens in the book of Proverbs. It gets muddier and muddier the further in you get. For time, I'll press, I'll press to what I'm going to make as the point. Um, I was helped greatly by a colleague of mine, Carol Newsom, um, over at Emory Candler School of the Theology. You probably studied with her. Uh, working on the book of Job, and she wrote at the time um, about what she called iconic narratives. That iconic, iconic narratives are a community's understandings of the deepest structures of creation. Iconic narratives are ways communities say, this is the way the world works. Now, iconic narratives, my hunch is that icon so, so, well, let me say it differently. The iconic narrative that the parent is teaching in the first nine chapters of the book and that extends later into the book is an iconic narrative that says, because God made the world, the world is not neutral. Woven into its very structures and systems is God's own wisdom. 
Yes, at times the wicked prosper. Yes, at times uh, the foolish uh, thrive. But those are exceptional moments, not the rule. Because, now I'll bring in Martin Luther King, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Why? Because God made the world so. So what, what I notice, and I'll just give just one second, what I notice in my own life is that I find, I found my iconic narrative. I stuttered into my iconic narrative in a moment of disorientation and grief. I'll, and I'll share a quick story. I think we often kind of bring it to voice when we're not, when we're in such moments. Um, so my younger sister, she knows I tell this story and I have permission. My younger sister, it's two in the morning. This was about 15 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, the phone rings at two in the morning and you know immediately, right? Two in the morning phone call, not good. Uh, my husband jumped up. I jumped up. I grabbed the phone. It was on my side of the bed, I picked up the phone and I could hear my sister on the other end of the phone, but I couldn't, I couldn't make out what she was saying. She, you know, she was sobbing so uncontrollably. Um, couldn't bring words. Um, uh, it was a, probably for 10 minutes, just this deep sobbing. Uh, and then she named why she was calling, which was that um, her, she and her husband, right shortly after the birth of their second child, had decided to separate. And she was utterly grief-stricken. And I can remember in the dark, I mean, we, didn't, we hadn't even turned on the lights yet. I was just on the phone trying to listen and um, understand what was happening. Um, I can remember in that moment, first of all, crying with her, and then saying, we love you. We'll get on a plane tomorrow. We're coming to you and your children. You're not alone. We love you. We'll be there. You're not alone. Somehow, in some way we can't yet imagine, this will work out. Now, notice, I didn't quote a biblical text. I didn't quote theology, systematic theology. I didn't pull from all the resources, texts, and traditions that I ought to have readily at hand. I stuttered into speech a very basic and quite biblical notion of the way the world works. We'll come, you're not alone. We'll come be with you. You have support. We will accompany you in your grief and your movement to new life. We're going to physically get on a plane and be in your presence as soon as possible. And somehow, the combination of all the efforts around you who love you will bring you and your children to a place of healing and wholeness, which is, in fact, what happened. So, dark of night, I, that moment to me is sort of crystallized as just this kind of iconic narrative. How do we name, you might not name it the same way, but how do we name the deepest inner workings of the world? And, the, and Proverbs says, those deepest inner workings are not neutral. We may not see it in our lifetime, but the arc of history is bending towards God's justice and peace. And our aim in seeking wisdom is to participate in that, to align ourselves with those structures and live as fully into it as we can. Okay, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah. So one of the things that I noticed or I think the Bible is written in a Yeah, so I, I really appreciate, yeah, I appreciate the question. I don't agree with the premise. Um, uh, I, I think actually Greek culture was more dualistic than Hebrew culture. Uh, in fact, the dualisms that we've inherited are Greek-influenced, not Hebrew-influenced. Uh, so the notion of the body and the spirit, for example, that's a Greek notion. That's not at all Hebrew anthropology. 
Um, it's also the case, I can point to texts in Proverbs even, where they speak about twilight. They speak about the early light of day. Um, this notion that uh, there are liminal times. In fact, when the fool goes out looking for the stranger woman, uh, wisdom's counterpart, when does the fool go out and sort of stutter towards her house? It's at twilight, in the early evening, right? At the end of the, break, at the, end of the day. So there is this sense of liminal in-between that breaks the sort of stark dichotomies. Um, so I don't want, we also know, the last thing I'll say, um, is that as you get further into the book of Proverbs, there's a lot more gray. And one of the ways you know that is we start to get what we call relative sayings. Um, we mentioned it in Sunday school yesterday. Uh, one of the um, tools, instruments that the sages use is better than Proverbs. It's better this than that. It's better to, to be in good company than to eat a fat ox, right? It's better to be with good people and be hungry, right, than eat a good ox and be all by yourself. The, there's a notion that, that there are things that are better than, not always, right? There's relative goods. Some, but most of the time, I, I said it in Sunday school yesterday, it's four out of five dentists think, you know, it's better to do this than to do that. Um, but that's a relative saying. There's recognition that at other times it's gray, right? Sometimes it's better to be alone and be stuffing your face with a fat ox than to be in the company of good friends. So I, I would question the premise um, uh, that, there's, that they were more dualistic. I think, um, if anything, sort of dualistic thinking arose rather late in Israel's history, somewhat under the influence of Persianism and, Persianisms and Greek notions. I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Okay, so can I move? Should I move? I know I can. I'm going to run out of time. We have 15 minutes. According to my, I think I have to 11.45, but stop me if I don't. Um, all right, so we've already talked about some of the genres. Uh, so when I say what is wisdom, it's a discourse. It's a kind of speech. Uh, what you'll notice if you look at Job and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes side by side, you'll notice there are some very common shared forms of speech. That is, sages have ways they talk. Part of the book of Proverbs is forming us into certain kinds of speech patterns, equipping us to speak into the moment. I do a sort of tool belt. Um, equipping us to speak in the moment with certain kinds of, a better than saying might be appropriate here. A prohibition might be really appropriate here. A command might be helpful here. Um, the most basic form of a proverb is a two-line saying. You see them throughout the book. Turn to Proverbs 10, and you see, you're going to see 12 chapters of them. Two-line proverb. This is a basic form of wisdom. It's also a basic form of Hebrew poetry. The two lines can be related to each other in a number of different ways. They can be roughly synonymous. The second line can continue the thought of the first. Or the second line can be the antithesis of the first line. Right? So the lines can be in different relationships to one another but it's a basic form of speech. Do not, for a second, think basic means simple or static. I'll, I'll just use one example. When I say to you, I won't use a biblical proverb, I'll use a more contemporary. When I say, a rolling stone gathers no moss, think for a moment, what does that proverb mean? Rolling stone gathers no moss. What does it mean? When would you say it? Who would you say it to? To a teenager who won't get out of bed. A rolling stone gathers no moss. So what, are you, what is the moss and what is the rolling in your interpretation? Get moving. Get moving. Okay, so get moving. If you tell it to a teenager who's not getting up early enough in the morning, a rolling stone gathers no moss. What are you trying to do? Get the teenager to roll. So rolling is good. How else might I understand this proverb? Someone's moving too fast, right? So you're constantly on the move. You never settle down. You never, you never sort of get to know the neighborhood you're living in or the community you're a part of. You're really kind of all by yourself just moving on, right? Moss suddenly becomes the desired part of the equation. And sta staying put 
becomes valued. Now, we could keep going. There are different, what I want, the basic point is, every proverb has multiple meanings. Every proverb has multiple meanings. And so much hinges on the capacity of the person who knows the proverb to say it, it's what we call proverb performance, to say the proverb into a circumstance in ways that resonate as true and helpful. I can, in the morning, tell it to my teenage son, get out of bed. And I can turn around to a friend who seemingly never, turns, never settles down to say, boy, I really wish you would let some moss grow on you. I don't know if I'd say that. But you know what I mean? That's, I can use the same proverb in different circumstances with different meanings. Every proverb has multiple meanings. So it's not enough to learn the Proverbs, memorize the Proverbs, and be able to speak them back. The wise person has to be able to read context and connect text to context. All right, which moves us to this next point. What is wisdom? It's a way of being, and it's a very challenging way of being. If you know wise people in your life, you, you, you can tease out these uh, aspects of them or experiences you've had where you've said, boy, that was a wise move. Typically, a wise person has the following two things. The first is moral skill. Moral skill is a capacity, the capacity to discern accurately what is happening in the moment. This is reading the room. I can read my circumstances to discern what's happening in the moment and to respond to it in ways that are appropriate and intelligent, thoughtful. It's a capacity to read your circumstances, read the newspaper, read the congregation, read the community, and respond in ways that people nod and say, that's intelligent, that's accurate. If you've, have you ever been in the presence of someone who people are expressing distress over a certain situation and somebody drops a proverb in and it's absolutely the wrong proverb? It makes no sense in context. Have you ever noticed what people do? They kind of, there's sort of this quizzical, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that's what that proverb, right? There's a, there's a wrestling about the circumstance being diagnosed by the proverb. And there's certainty that the proverb is the wrong diagnosis. They t the sages of Proverbs talk about the fool as brandishing a proverb like a sword of a drunkard. Right? They're, they're stabbing, trying to find a place to land the sword because they don't know, they can't, they can't connect the circumstances and the text. They can't, command, they can't connect the tradition with what's happening around them. You must have moral skill this capacity to read a room, to read your circumstances. Paired with that, you must have moral will. Moral will is a disposition. It's the disposition that loves honesty, loves justice, loves beauty, loves faithfulness, and hates, this is language of emotion, we talked about someone in Sunday school yesterday, hates wickedness, moves against wickedness, uh, and seeks in all things to do the right thing. And notice, right is in quotes. Depends, it depends on the circumstances. What's the right thing? It's seeking to do the right thing, the just thing, the beautiful thing, the loving thing. You have to have both to be wise. And here's why. I can be someone who has moral capacity, moral skill, but if I have no moral will, it's very easy for me to manipulate circumstances to my own ends. I'm not guided by justice or faithfulness or beauty or equity. I can move a room because I can read the room, and I can move it in the directions I want it to go without being guided by these deeper dispositional commitments. It's dangerous. In the same way, if I have moral skill, moral will, excuse me, but no moral skill, 
I can, I can really want to do something for justice, but have no capacity to, to make it happen, to invite a community to participate with me, to con connect groups to missions and efforts that they find resonate with their own sense of call and conviction. You have to have both. One without the other is either dangerous in the case of moral skill without moral will, or ineffectual, as in the case of moral will without moral skill. Fair enough? So it's hard work to be wise. You have to have both capacities. Which brings us um, to um, fear of the Lord. So the book of Proverbs, the, it is easily the, the case that one, well, if you have your Bibles, go back to Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1 I'm in the Psalms. Okay, Proverbs 1. Begins with a prologue, if time permits, which it may not. We'll look at the prologue. But at, right after the prologue of the book of Proverbs, we get what we call, those of us who work in Proverbs, call the motto of the book. It's Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, an interesting thing, we'll talk about fear of the Lord in a moment. In Sunday, in Sunday school, I know Curtis has been using um, some reflections on fear of the Lord, so some of you have thought about this concept. One thing to note about Proverbs 1.7 is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The Hebrew term being translated here as beginning is reshit, Rashit can mean, as it does in Genesis 1, the beginning of things, or the beginning of the story we're about to tell, the beginning in temporal terms, the starting point. So, Barashit Barahim, in the beginning God created, that's the first three words of the Hebrew Bible, and it is about the sort of temporal starting point, when God began to create. Rashit can also mean the fullest. Uh, expression of or epitome of. The fear of the Lord, understood in that way, so fear of the Lord can be where one begins. One must have this disposi disposi disposition of fear of the Lord to begin. It's also the place where one arrives when one is wise. It's the fullest expression of. It's the epitome of. Walter Brueggemann has a wonderful article where he talks about praise, drawing on this very same play with Rashid. Praise is the beginning and end of the human calling. It's where we start and it's where we end. Same notion is at work here with fear of the Lord. Now, what is fear of the Lord? Fear of the Lord is not a phrase that we are accustomed to using, preaching, teaching in in. I suspect most church, uh, churches I'm in, churches I visit, churches I preach in and teach in, very few say, yes, we talk about fear of the Lord all the time. It is a significant theological phrase for us. Raise your hand if it's different for you. No. It's largely fallen out of um, common use um, in no small way because of the language of fear. Um, we don't want to be worshiping a God we fear, and, friends, it has been used, the notion of a God we should fear has been put to horrific ends. So I don't want you for a second, fire and brimstone, I don't want you for a second to hear me saying um, that I advocate that kind of preaching or teaching or theology. I do think, however, by forsaking the idiom or forsaking the notion of fear of the Lord, we have forsaken a pretty significant biblical claim about the posture of the human in relationship to God. And here's why. In Proverbs, if you study all the fear of the Lord sayings, yes, I did, fear all the fear of the Lord sayings, pay somebody else to do it, all the fear of the Lord sayings, what you discover is that some of the fear of the Lord sayings are about fear, the emotion, fear, fight or flight, save your life, fear. You should fear God and the king. Why, says Proverbs? Because you don't know what either one of them is going to do. Fear, the emotion fear, that is actually an instrument by which the body tries to save itself. 
Fear can be a good emotion. It doesn't have to be inherently a bad emotion. Fear can actually help us live. But, so at one end of this sort of thinking about fear is fear as an emotion. Fear of the Lord is also used in wisdom and in Deuteronomy and other texts in the Old Testament as language for piety, reverence, the mysterium tremendums, right? When you're in the presence of the holy, you should be quaking with, uh, um, is it Annie Dillard who talks about going to worship and putting on a seatbelt uh, crash helmet? Because if, really if you were really thinking, I'm going to be in the presence of the sovereign Lord of the universe, you might want some protection, friends. <laughs> There's a reason why the priests, right, you had to be prepared in a particular way to enter the sanctuary. You are going into the presence of the Holy One. It should change how you comport yourself. So this notion of awe or sort of mysterium tremendums. And at the other end of the spectrum, some of these proverbs talk about sort of a conscience, um, a way of thinking and engaging the world that is deeply steeped in God's uh, commandments and will for us. It, 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 it is profoundly faithful, discipleship-oriented, informed by deep, fierce faith convictions. Proverbs sages insist you keep the whole spectrum. Don't you dare give up the notion of fear as fear. Don't you dare give up the notions of quaking in the presence of the holy. Why? Because when you do, you either have an exaggerated sense of yourself or you've put God into a nice little box and God meets all of your satisfactions and longings um, and God looks exactly the way you think God should look. But God has no freedom, no capacity to be a sovereign who is like, uh, to use um, Barbara Brown Taylor's language, far more like an eagle is to a mouse. So fear of the Lord in wisdom insists on this posture in the presence of God and part of what that is, so it's about living into the fullness of who you are, recognizing there are limits. And those limits are set by the God who created the whole world and you. Our knowledge only goes so far. Our insights will only take us to a certain point. Our physical strength will only enable us to build so much. Re living into the fullness of who we are and recognizing the bounds of our own knowledge and understanding is a critical aspect of wisdom. At a certain point, friends, there just is mystery. And, and acknowledging such, as opposed, you see the, in Job and you'll see in Ecclesiastes, don't say more than you know. Right? Don't say more than you know. Job calls his friends quacks because they're trying to explain innocent suffering. Don't say more than you know. For to do so is to cross this threshold. All right, so do I have, I think I have two minutes. May I take the last two minutes? No, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I, I won't. I'll get, to, I'll get going. Um, so if you were here yesterday <clears throat> with, um, this is where the wonder and awe comes in. Um, so I, I preached on Exodus 3, if you weren't here yesterday, um, and tried to pull the theme, whether I did it or not, I don't know, but tried to pull the theme of Moses' wonder um, as a critical aspect of that story. Uh, that was the connection with, is today to this, the notion that the wise person engages the world with wonder and awe. Absolutely positive that that engagement will yield, because God made the world, will yield insight, will guide wisdom. So what is the posture of the wise person constantly? In Proverbs 1 to 9, I could argue in another time uh, that the parent who's seeking to form the youth in those first nine chapters, the most repeated feature is the call to attention. Pay attention. Listen to me. Bind my teachings on your on your finger, bind them across your heart, right? Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. 
the posture is one about, if you've been a parent or an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent, you know sometimes with a kid you're doing this. Just keep your eyes on me. I know that's happening over there. Just get you, right? You're trying to keep, hold their attention. Stay with me. Stay with me. Right? That's part of parenting, caring for the next generation. Uh, and some of that, by doing that over and over again, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, listen to me, listen to me, incline your ear to me, incline your ear to me, over and over again for nine chapters. What is the child also learning? That the posture for seeking wisdom and guidance and learning is to listen to lean in, to pay attention, to look, to see, to ask. So what is in the beginning of Proverbs, the formation in a family, the sort of beginning of the formation of a, of a youth into the convictions and claims and values of the family, also becomes formation of a human who is disposed to kind of lean in and pay attention. No, it's not. Absolutely. So it is, there is, um, and the parent, one of the ways the parent gets at this is the parent um, sort of keeps beckoning the child back, but the parent is the only one speaking. Right? The parent talks about wisdom speaking and God speaking and talks about the stranger woman who's going to make an appeal of her own and the street gang in the first chapter that's going to also make an appeal. The parent says, there are going to be a lot of people doing this with you. And my job is to sort of help you choose what story are you going to live your life by? Who do you want to be like? And hopefully it's like your family. Hopefully it's like, and my job is to form you in that. But it's a live question in the first nine chapters. Who do you want to be like? Whose company are you going to keep? Because we believe, the sages believed, you are formed by that, inextricably formed by that. So it is very active. Who are you going to pay attention to? Who do you want to be like? Okay, I think, friends, I have to stop. But maybe this conversation is the beginning of a conversation, um, and there might be opportunity another time uh, to dive even more deeply into the book of Proverbs as an example of what it is we've been talking about. Um, please know that I give thanks for this community and for this time together, um, for the generous hospitality, and I will pray as ever uh, for our wonder and our awe and our search for wisdom, uh, each and every one of us. So many, many thanks.